Today what we're going to cover is I'm going to cover infection control and OSHA requirements and then a couple of cases uh, that I've followed and some that I've say, uh, served on. One of the cases I've served on on behalf of the plaintiffs uh, with respect to infection control issues. So I'm Raghu Putaya and I'm a proud owner of an uh, educational company now. I retired as a tenured professor from Texas A&M College of Dentistry. So, <clears throat> it's boring stuff. Uh, I'm a Shula, the uh, epidemiologist, a dentist. I graduated from India in 1983. I'm old. And <laughs> yeah, with age comes gray hair and dad jokes. Yeah. Uh, most of you have kids, right? They'll tell, you'll be telling dad jokes. Uh, I practiced uh, two days a week in India, and the rest of the time I used to do school health programs, like go to a school, examine all the kids, have a triplicate form, I'd keep one form, the school would keep one, and then the parent would get what the kids' needs are. And they could go to any dentist. I got to know how much money there was in the school health fund always because one of my best buddies was a CPA for most of the schools. So he'd tell me, you need to go attack this school. They have money. If they don't spend it, they'll put it into the library fund. So I used to go make money in public health. So I was making four times the salary my dad would make as a very senior civil engineer with the state. So I was a young kid staying at home with boatloads of money in the bank, okay? <clears throat> so public health does make money. You have to think clearly, you know? I'm a capitalist. I'm socially a very liberal guy, but financially, when you're not having fun, I'll say, yeah, we shouldn't pay taxes. You know, I'm just, I'm, I'm like the rest of Texas, you know? So anyway, then, since I was doing the school health programs, the uh, Indian Council of Medical Research, which is like National Institutes or uh, Health and Human Services kind of a thing, and the local uh, cancer center wanted me to head a program where they didn't tell me what the job was. They said, you got to screen about 30,000 people. We'll give you all the help. You'll have a team of 15 people. You'll be at, you know, supervising. You'll have your own. A uh, mini bus will give you a car and two drivers. I said, oh, hog heaven, <laughs> you know, and a civil servant. So a federal officer. That's what I was. What I didn't realize was after I signed the papers and my life away to the feds, they said, you got to take this team of people and go to the rural parts of India, stay there for five days, you know, in circuit houses or you figure that out. That's what they said. Okay, for the next three years, five days a week, we used to be in the villages. You know, what we did made Indiana Jones look like a Boy Scout. I'm not joking. We had scorpions, we had spiders, we had snakes, and we had cholera. How to keep all these 15 people functional, and then you have to go at six o'clock in the morning and knock on the doorsteps, or doors of every villager, to go screen them for oral cancer because they used a lot of chewing tobacco. So I only fired one person. Nobody fell sick in those three years, but everybody hated me. So I had to make, wake up at four or three o'clock in the morning, make coffee for everybody, take coffee like a servant. Say, I'm a civil servant, here is a coffee, wake up, please wake up, and so on. And yeah, that's what I did. I got tired. After the first phase, I said, I'm done. I need to get more education. So I was just a dentist, right? Came to the University of Alabama, got my master's in public health and chronic disease epidemiology. And then since I was a dentist, they said, why don't you do your residency in dental public health? I said, sure. Did that. Then Dr. James Cotton said in San Antonio, that he needed a fellow, postdoctoral fellow in infectious diseases, a Johnson & Johnson fellowship. So they got me there for four years. After that, I was out of money, I was tired of studying, got a job at Baylor or Texas A&M College of Dentistry. And I got tired of teaching in 2000, 
uh, and 19th, I said, quits. I'm not teaching. I'm going to start my own company. So here I am. Anyway, the um, rest of the stuff is all history. So background on dental safety. See, if you go to a medical office for a checkup, first they'll take a temperature. You'll have to call them, right, from outside in your car, just like how we do. They take a temperature. They say, have you been to any places or been exposed to anybody with COVID? Stupid question, because when you're exposed to a person with COVID who is walking around, no temperature, they are actually shedding the most amount of viruses, loads. The viral loads are higher. And only later you'll get to know, two days later, they'll call you and say, dude, I got COVID. <laughs> By then you'll have finished your doctor's visit, right? So that's a fairly stupid question, I mean, in retrospect. That's number one. Then they take a temperature, they give you a form to fill or an iPad, you kind of punch your stuff, they take your weight and it, uh, you know, your temperature and your blood pressure. They'll put you in a dark room, the doctor will come, he'll look at you, he'll take the history, whatever things, and then at best their exposure to you would be to, you know, you know, auscultate you and then say, adios, write a prescription, you're out. In a dental office, we are like, you know, leeches and vultures waiting for the patient. Patient comes in, open your mouth. The assistant will be looking more into the mouth than the dentist, you know, and we'll be kind of swapping spit, you know, within one foot radius of the mouth. And then everybody's worried about gleek too, right? I mean, I've never been gleeked at, but yeah. So then we hit blood, we hit saliva, which is as uh, infectious as blood. So we actually, you know, what do you call, generate more exposure. And the exposure time is also about 40 minutes for a procedure. We do surgical stuff. We cut teeth, we cut bone, we cut soft tissue. We have, we like blood, we like the smell of blood, you know. So we are at a higher risk than a medical a family practitioner. We can compare ourselves to a surgeon. That's why we're called oral or dental surgeons. Some people call themselves DMDs, but they're still surgeons, okay? <coughs> so, <coughs> the standards were written in the 60s. The Health and Human Services wrote the blood-borne standards because of hepatitis C. I mean, hepatitis B, I mean, I mean. So dentists, close to 26% of the dentists were, had active hepatitis B infections, some were carriers. In fact, the, one of my professors in epidemiology, his, thesis, his dissertation in California was looking at oral surgeons causing these hepatitis B clusters. They were infected, they were carriers, and they were creating one office had a cluster of 50 patients who had picked up uh, hepatitis B. So they wrote the standards for blood-borne pathogens then. But then what happened in the late 70s and early 80s, we got a vaccine, a workable vaccine for hep B. Boom, those standards, those guidelines went under the rug because we had a magic bullet. Then comes 1982. Ooh, a disease with a social stigma. That was HIV. It was predominantly among homosexual males. At that time, most of the dentists were male. It is not that they adopted the recommendations and guidelines of the CDC because they were such nice people. It was because they didn't want to be called a homosexual in case they picked up the disease, right? especially in Texas. So that generated people into adopting the 1993 standards, the 2003 guidelines, <clears throat> and then it started waning away. All of a sudden, you know, you know, actually in November of 2019, I read one article in the New, Eng New England Journal of Medicine which kind of triggered 
exactly the same thoughts as I had in 19 and 2002. 2002, there was SARS. It's the same family. Then came bird flu, okay? AH1N1 influenza kind of a thing. Then all these were airborne conditions and they were of zoonotic origin. It started off in either, you know, what you call a poultry facility where a bunch of birds were infected and then it jumped onto humans. That's what happened with uh, SARS and then the avian flu. I said, I put this up on uh, Facebook, of course. I mean, I'm a big time, my face is in Facebook, actually. If you see Facebook, you ask Zuckerberg, who do you want to be your mascot? He'll say Putaya. You know, so I'm, morning I get up, instead of looking at my messages, I look at Facebook. At two o'clock at night when I'm trying to kind of sleep, I look at Facebook. <laughs> and then I look at Uncle Roger, who wants to make uh, the perfect, uh, you know, what they call fried rice with gal <laughs> and use galangal, <laughs> you know, fio, as he says, okay? So, in 2019, I said that and everybody pounced on me. Oh, you're all the purveyor of doom and everybody. I mean, some of our friends, my ex-students, why do you scare people? I said, I'm not scaring people. I'm just, you're just scared. You're a scaredy cat. <laughs> <laughs> then comes Jan. There are infections in Wuhan. Then comes February. Eight infections in the US. I was trying to see who this idiot was who tried to pick on me in November. <laughs> okay, I mean, I'm very vocal, actually, you know, I'm with people, but on Facebook I have to maintain my dignity because occasionally my wife looks into it. <laughs> <coughs> so, 2020 was beautiful. I didn't know the world had so many infection control, infectious diseases, occupational safety, experts in the world. They all <laughs> popped up on social media. I've never heard of names, and they were actually lecturing to huge populace of dentists at the ADA meeting, the Southwest Dental Conference, and underwritten by, you know, Hugh Friedy or Crostex or Procter & Gamble, all those things, yeah. Misinformation, disinformation. They compared it to influenza. I said, if, you, if this was in March of 2020, I look at numbers. When I looked at the total number of reported, actually diagnosed cases of um, influenza versus that month's total number of cases of diagnosed uh, COVID, it was 57 times, not 57 percent, uh, percent, times more infective than COVID. When I put that up, oh, again, there was this, uh, you know, what you call shower of arrows coming at me. I said, to heck with you guys, you know. You don't read, but you want everything spoon-fed, but you want what you want. You want me to confirm your biases, so go on. So. The bloodborne pathogen guidelines were written before 2002. In 2002, when we saw SARS come, that's when they started working and adding on to the TB's airborne exposure or additional precautions. So there were universal precautions, that was for bloodborne pathogens, then additional or transmission based precautions that came up for airway. Do you know that uh, before Ignaz Semmelweis, in the 17th, 18th and you know, century, people used, whenever there was plague or any epidemic going on, people would shut the windows and doors and not let anybody in because they thought that the diseases spread through air or they called it bad air. Yes, some of them do. They call that miasma or miasma, okay? 
miasma happened again with COVID. Okay. So at that time, they didn't know that bugs or microbes existed. So anyway, so then, you know, dentists started swallowing the Kool-Aid. And then you have these groups, uh, the hygienist groups, the dental assistant groups, the Dallas peeps, the Arizona peeps, the triangle peeps. They just peep out, you know, and everybody was swallowing it. And then I get calls. Does hydrogen peroxide work, you know, as a mouthwash to control COVID? I said, dude, mouthwashes don't control COVID. COVID is a disease of your upper respiratory tract. So are you going to shove hydrogen peroxide into that? By the way, you know why these guys were calling me? They wanted to confirm the bias, which they had in their mind, because some idiot had published one study, and everybody, you know, not in science, but in practice, thought that was God's given gift, a silver bullet. The reason these guys wanted to move to hydrogen peroxide in the third world, where it was third or lesser developed countries, where I come from one of them, was hydrogen peroxide is like bleach, it's cheap. Whereas chlorhexidine is $14 a bottle. <laughs> you know, you can get the same amount for a buck and a half at Walgreens, that is uh, hydrogen peroxide. I said, have you ever put hydrogen peroxide in your mouth? It's horrible tasting. Chlorhexidine at least leaves, it leaves a bad aftertaste, but at least it's okay, you know? Listerine is good, scope is good, you know? All of them kill the virus. Oh, we are looking at the FDA's list. I said, dude, if it kills one enveloped virus, the one with the fatty coating, it kills almost all of them. The companies always want to get their FDA clearance for marketing purposes. You know why? Because they want to sell and say that this kills COVID, the virus that causes yeah, COVID-19 uh, you know, infections. They did the same thing with other stuff. This uh, germicide kills AIDS, uh, HIV, the virus that causes AIDS. They sold that as Kool-Aid. So most of us drank Kool-Aid, you know. You don't have to go to Jonestown. I don't know. Many of you don't know Jonestown, but a lot of people drank, you know, tainted Kool-Aid. It had a skull and crossbones mark on it, toxin. So anyway, so HIV. There's only one recorded uh, case of HIV transmission in dentistry. I mean, of one clinic, or one doctor infecting patients. David Acker, David uh, Johnson, or Jonathan Ac Acker, yeah, was a doctor practicing in Florida. And uh, he infected Kimberly Brigalis and five others, so six cases in total. He contracted AIDS in 1986, and soon after he died. but. It still is a mystery. One of his co-workers said that he never, he did the black box sterilization. You know what black box sterilization is? In the past, before sterilization of dental instruments was required, people used to wipe it down at best with a disinfectant, shops and stuff. And some would actually stick it into the Alabama cabinet, you know, and the next morning it would be sterilized. Yeah, of course. That's called black box. Okay. <clears throat> he didn't wash his hands and didn't wear gloves when it was introduced at that time. I mean, when I came to the US, everybody was supposed to be wearing gloves, but I saw endodontists clipping off the tips of the gloves <laughs> because they, didn't, they couldn't get proprioception. You had to heck with proprioception, you know. Today the machines do it. You know, you don't have to do it by hand. The machines have proprioception. How many of you believe that? <laughs> it gets transmitted into your hands, to your brain, and then you slowly pull it back. Yeah, so that was the first big infectious disease case. 
guy died soon after, along with the other patients, and there was a nice book written by it. By the way, uh, when I was doing my fellowship, there was box loads of documents of that case, which were later sealed uh, due to court orders. And Dr. Katon, who trained me, you know, today the Bible of Infection Control for Dentistry is Katon's thing. So, uh, he was the one who actually investigated the case. I mean, there were other big names who brought the case up, but the feds asked them to, him to look at it. The CDC asked him to look at it, and then, <coughs> so, so that was the first case. After that, actually, there haven't been any reported HIV cases, okay? Why did the ADA and the CDC strengthen infection control guidelines in 1983? So there was this, uh, 1993. There was a case called Sharp versus Briglio. Okay? Sharp was a patient. He got HIV and AIDS later. He sued the dentist Breglio. This was in 19, uh, you, know, you know, around 1980, uh, 1993 to uh, 1992. That was around the time, okay? Before 1993, the CDC said, and the ADA said, just wipe down everything, your hand pieces and stuff like that, but sterilize your instruments, autoclave your instruments. The reason they said that was because the hand pieces were not designed and were not good enough. They used phenolic bearings. So if you stuck it into a dry heat sterilizer or into an autoclave or into a chemiclave, the lifespan would you know, diminish of the hand piece. So they said that. So Sharp lost the case because only after he had sued, did the CDC come up with the 1993 recommendations saying that all instruments that go into the oral cavity must be sterile or must be clean single-use disposable or sterile single-use disposable. They're considered either critical or semi-critical according to Spalding's classification. Okay, so, <coughs> sorry. So Sharp got HIV and AIDS, and probably he must, must have died because during those days, when I was doing my fellowship, I had colleagues who had HIV. The first case of uh, HIV among dental students was, my, was one of the students in a, the dental school who had just graduated, and we made him the director of the AIDS Foundation Clinic because that's where he could treat patients. Otherwise, the states would hold him back, okay? Now, There was one case uh, where they talked about hepatitis B virus transmission patient to patient in a dental setting. And that was how they got to know was they started using uh, molecular epidemiologic measures or testing, okay? Science had improved. This was in 2002, okay? Uh, there were totally 161 patients seen, I mean, there were totally, a bunch of patients were seen in oral surgery. There were two patients seen 160 minutes apart, okay? So there was a donor case and then the index case. When they matched the blood, okay, I mean the, <clears throat> the virus, it was of the same, um, parent pattern, okay? So that was the first ever proven case from a patient to patient. Before that, it was all here, I mean, here and say uh, kind of a thing. Here, they can actually get up to a 100% match between the donor's uh, hepatitis B virus to the recipient's hepatitis B virus within, given, you know, within a month or so, you know? Because then you'll have 
different, you know, what you call mutations, and there'll be changes. The longer you wait, the match will be lesser. You know, the percentage of match will be lesser. So they did serological testing of 25 uh, of the 27 patients, and <clears throat> revealed that 19 of those 25 patients that actually acquired hepatitis B, patient-to-patient -patient transmission through dentistry. What they found was that there were no deficiencies in infection control. I don't know who did that, because if they let me inspect, I can find, I found deficiencies in every single dental clinic. You know, infection control, OSHA, and HIPAA. How many of you have done a fire drill after you opened your clinic? Any hands up here? One, two, three. Okay, there's so many dentists. And of course, the previous uh, speaker, he did a fire drill because, uh, I mean, he does a fire drill at least once or twice a year because his neighboring <laughs> clinic got burned. <laughs> he told me that. I said, woo, woo hoo, you know? So, you can, from a fire drill to anything you can find. But they said there were no deficiencies, so the bar must have been very low, okay? So, then hepatitis B transmission patient to patient in an outpatient medical clinic. There was this crazy lady who was actually injecting patients with the same syringe. Of course, she changed the needles. I mean, this is not back in the 1980s. This is recently, okay? Where, <clears throat> a seven, I mean, like, you know, 8.9%, uh, 3.9%, uh, 8.9% of the hepatitis B patients, 3.9%, I mean, I'm sorry, 8.9% uh, uh, of the hepatitis C patients and 3.9% of the hepatitis B patients met the case definition. They'd acquired it by going to this place. There was another case where, uh, you know, we all go to do our service to the community, right? To a dental camp, or, you know, tea moms, or uh, Mission of Mercy, and stuff like that. There was one case where a bunch of people got hepatitis B from that. You know why? They were probably doing black box sterilization. You know? The sterilization was not good enough. If you guys happen to do any, you know, what you call service uh, work in other countries or anything, take a big pressure cooker or a pressure pot. Cook your instruments for 30 minutes after it reaches the 120, I mean, uh, it reaches the 15 PSI, you know, on your gauge. Use a stopwatch, 30 minutes, then take your instruments out and then treat the patients, okay? If you don't have an autoclave out there, I keep telling people that. Oh, don't, you don't have to, you know, what you call do sport testing. That's another story for another day. Those are not good enough, actually, if you look at it. The nurse anesthetist used the same syringe needle here in this place, in this clinic, uh, to sequentially administer. The words are love, sequentially. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, this thing, syringe looks bad. Now I'll take a new syringe. And then one, two, three, four, five. She probably changed the needles. How can you do that? Okay, so. Now, after this, a few years ago, one of our ex, my previous employer's ex-students, an oral surgeon in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, He spread the first recorded case of hepatitis C in a dental setting. And two patients were infected, they sued. So they came to us and then they asked me if I wanted to serve on the case. I don't like taking up these cases. 
I only served on two major cases in my life. One was four states against a major dental manufacturer. Everybody uses their stuff. California, New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania sued this manufacturer. It went on for about eight years in federal court, multi-state plus action lawsuit. I served on that. Then the next big one was this one. I keep getting calls from lawyers all the time whether I want to serve, I said nope. But this one was kind of intriguing. So I served on this, my boss served on the first HIV case, I served on the first Hep C case, and it was good. So what happened was, this oral surgeon, beautiful office, in a lovely neighborhood, he saw both types of patients, you know, patients with HIV and patients with no HIV, okay? You walk into the office, it's beautiful, but you know in oral surgery, you take them to the uh, sedation room or place like that, and then you sedate them, and then you open up your instruments, right? <laughs> you don't know whether you have uh, a hacksaw from your garage, or <laughs> you have sterile instruments. So patient doesn't know. Nobody is allowed inside the operating suite either to actually look at it. So don't trust your oral surgeon. I'm just kidding. This guy was an oddball, I must say. So, <clears throat> so what I'm talking, I cannot speak about what I saw in all the records, but I can talk about the published thing because the records are sealed again, you know. Uh, insurance companies, they go to the court, they tell you the court, okay, we've settled out of court, please seal the records, the court will seal the records. So much for science, okay. Positive. Hepatitis C lab results reported to Oklahoma State Department. It is a reportable condition. So if you, if any lab comes across hepatitis C or HIV or today COVID, all of them are reported to the county health department. So the story goes like this. There was this patient, a middle-aged male, who was a regular blood donor for many, many years. He went and got an implant placed by the oral surgeon. <clears throat> okay. A few weeks later, he went to donate blood. They said, we can't take your blood anymore. I said, why? You have hepatitis C. That means once you get hepatitis C, you are always a carrier if you survive the initial infection, right? So we can't give, you can't give blood anymore. So this guy went back, you know, sad and everything and life went on. But there was an epidemiologist at the county, I mean at the Oklahoma State Department who was reviewing these reported cases and then he went back into the history of this patient and said, this dude has donated blood so many times to the same, you know, donor center. They've taken his blood, so he went back and looked into their records to see if they had kind of missed testing him in the past, but they thought tested him every time he, he donated blood. And he said, he picked up the phone Found, found out who this person was and called the guy and said, okay, what? Uh, how many sexual partners do you have? He said, one, my wife, and she's hep C negative. Good. Well, just stay, stay away from her. <laughs> you know, hep C is a carrier, yep. Then he said, where all have you, have you had any blood donation? Do you take blood? He said, nope, I'm not a vampire. Okay, good. Did you get any surgical care, any surgeries done? So this chap was thinking about medical. He said, no. Then he said, did you go to any dental or tattoo parlor or he said, I, you know, a few months ago, I went to a dentist, three months ago, I went to a dentist's office. 
an oral surgeon, he placed an implant. Bingo. They found out who that was, came and asked them the initial visit. They said, we're doing a spot check, the, the state health department. They can actually put a yellow tape around the state health department, the county health department, irrespective of what the state's board say, can lock your clinic down. Okay, they came, they just walked through. They said, show us all your records, show us all your training records. Uh, let's have a walk through. Show us your sterilization area. Guess what they found? The guy didn't have any records of training. Okay. <clears throat> didn't um, produce a medication log. You know, they use all kinds of medicines in oral surgery, right? During sedation and stuff like that. Some have to be refrigerated and thawed out to room temperature, and then they have to be uh, used, and some are, once you open, you have to dispose of the remainder, or some can be put back in. You can't just draw for the whole day and keep it. This is what this guy was doing. They didn't have any medication logs of what they dispensed, what medication, which patient, what time, what batch, what lot, and the date of expiration, none. Okay? No inventory sheet for logging in and out for the controlled meds. You know, when I go and do a walkthrough of a oral surgeon's office and I say, show me your controlled meds. You know what? They pull out two keys. One, there's a safe, which is a refrigerated safe. You have to open it with one key, take the thing out, then you have to punch in a keypad is there, and after that, within 15 seconds or 30 seconds, you've got to put the second key and open it and then take it out. And they have a log, and it has to be absolutely up to date. Okay, well, nothing was there. But they produced the medication log in the second visit. That means somebody had spent, you know, what you call burnt the midnight oil and filled in whatever they could. I've seen that in the past, as far as sterilization logs are concerned. People have cooked up stuff. I say, don't cook the stuff, stuff up when you're being investigated. That is a fraud. They can put fraud charges against you for lying, okay? No documentation as to who administered. And by the way, dental assistants who had no training, no formalized training, no continuing education, nothing. They were actually sticking IV stuff in, okay? Then, <clears throat> yeah, they used Valium, Ketamine, Propofol. All of these are controlled uh, medications, right? Multi-dose vials in each uh, dental assistance plastic tray, checked out in the AM and checked back at the end of the day. No, you dispense for the patient and check it back. That is what is taught. You know, you walk into oral surgery at Baylor, there is actually a person who logs you in and logs out every single thing. It is, you come two minutes after it's logged in and logged out, it's there in the record. None of those are there. Naloxone, atropine sulfate, they were all opened and expired. Expired meds, injectables, right? Labetalol, two unopened vials, and then propofol, you know, unopened, they're all dispensed, ketamine opened, diazepam uh, bottle was opened, okay? So uh, there were multiple errors, and these are very significant errors. You know what they look at when they do an investigation, any of the agencies? Is there a threat to life or no threat to life? That is how they look at it. They look at it in a dualistic way, life, uh, life or death. They don't have anything in between, there are no explanations. You can't explain anything else. They look at the records, okay? No dates marked on the medication vials. Some of them can be reused, but if they're reused, you have to put a date and then when you, can actually, when you need to actually dispose of the chemical, you see? Uh, no patient's names on the IV bags. Okay, so, so they used to draw in the morning for 
the whole day's thing. And if somebody didn't come, they'd probably put it back and use it the next day. And I'm very sure, you know, once you have the IV bag in, you can actually inject other medications in. I'm very sure uh, that the injection is not done at the level of the IV bag because that's always higher. They must have done it at the lower injection area where there'll be an additional port, okay? And they might have used the same syringe. Okay, that is how it could have been. Otherwise, there's no way. You know, there are so many control measures when they design the IV pole, forget, you know, what you call it. The port closer to your body is at a lower level and it can have a flow back or a suck back. So, there were so many errors uh, which, which happened. Then they used to give atropine sulfate. You know, it was an open and expired bottle only to black patients. You know why? Because black patients salivate, right? Yeah, it is the genetic thing of colored people. I mean, think about it. Outright discrimination, okay? In the 21st century, and that too. I mean, I don't know when we will learn. No infection control, OSHA, sedation training logs, or proof of training. They did not have, okay, sterilization logs for the past six years or 10 years. No sterilization logs. You know, the instruments for HIV patients are known infectious disease patients were separate from those who did not report any infectious diseases. They're, they're, they're alone, you know, there is, you're going against universal precautions. You do not ask a patient and use what the patient tells you. You treat everybody as potentially infectious, be it your wife, your child, your dog, in your dental chair. You know, all of them are infectious. So you got to use the universal precautions. Universal precautions is not what you do with your hands or the control measures. It is up here. You know, that is universal precautions. Do not discriminate based on the history, you know, or reporting or how a patient looks, okay, on using your protective measures. Do it based on the procedure you're going to do. That, that, the procedure determines rather than your, you know, history. Okay. So when a person says I'm HIV zero positive, or I don't know, do you do a HIV test in your clinic? No. So there again, your data collection is wrong, isn't it? So, so the end of the day, Oh, sterilization room, rusted instruments. So this guy never used the wraps, cassettes, or sterilization pouches. Instruments were sterilized. He used a gauze and that zebra tape to hold the gauze in place. And then he uh, went ahead and treated the patients. The instruments were rusted. I mean, corroded beyond what uh, I, I can't talk about that. Anyway, long story short is separate instruments for patients with HIV and stuff like that. He, they used for those patients, infectious patients, they soaked the instruments, the high carbon steel instruments in bleach before sterilization. You know, so uh, no spore testing, yeah, okay. There was no ultrasonic machine in an oral surgeon's clinic. I don't know whether they cleaned the instruments to begin with, I don't know. So anyway, what they found when they looked at the logs of the patients, there was one known hepatitis C patient seen at about 11 o'clock in the morning in chair A. <clears throat> and at one o'clock, they had placed the implant on this uh, index patient 
you know, the, the recipient, the index patient in the same chair. So there was hardly two hours difference. So a known hepatitis C patient and then the recipient, they were seen in the same chair within two hours. Did this change the IV bags? Did they change the needle? Nobody knows. So, <clears throat> so the state health department called patients back a few years who had been seen by the oral surgeon. They went through their appointment records. 7,300 patients they called, they tried to contact. About 6,000 uh, 6, uh, patients came in for the testing. They test for he HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C. Then they found this, they found a bunch of patients who were infected in the clinic. Okay. <clears throat> so around 3,000 patients reported for blood test. Four patients confirmed for HIV, 13 reactive for hepatitis B and confirmed. But one case of hepatitis C, they knew it came from the previous patient seen in the same chair. So what they did was, they used molecular techniques, quasi-species. Let me talk a little bit about that. So everybody out here, and today we're all talking about do we need the booster? Oh, I was infected with uh, COVID, so I won't get it, you know. The longer the virus is not controlled. See, the virus needs a host to infect. If they keep finding multiple hosts, the virus will thrive. So you heard of herd uh, immunos, immunity? We have herd mentality, but we don't have herd immunity as far as confirmation bias is concerned. But the more number of people, you know, CDC said 70%, 75%. Actually, for COVID, it, is, it has to be at about 90, 90 plus percent, 94, 93 percent, that is when you get herd immunity. The way this thing is replicating, it's changing, it's, you know, it's cold, it's becoming a variant. That's where quasi-species comes in, okay? Quasi-species is when it resides in a person for a given time, okay, There's, and not treated, you know, with uh, suboxone and stuff like that, it develops a separate species and it keeps changing code over time, okay? So you have the parent genotype and then you have the quasi-species which changes over time. They took the blood of the initial patient who was seen, that 11 o'clock patient, and they took the blood of this person <coughs> and what they found was a hundred percent match, okay? Both in the uh, <clears throat> genotype and in the quasi-species. If they had waited for a few more months, then they couldn't have tested the quasi-species because it would have changed code again. You were lucky. And then they confirmed it. Yeah, so that's basically the cases. We've seen, okay, the important cases I've come across. Now, last year, five of my ex-students called me because they were being in, inspected or investigated by OSHA because of complaints. There were multiple others who called me as well. But what I'm saying is, it hits you close to your heart when OSHA doesn't think about dentistry as a big thing. They're worried about transportation, they're worried about airlines, they're worried about construction, agriculture, where there are deaths and disabilities. In dentistry, oops, I had a prick, exposure, I had a splash. That's basically what it is. So we are a drop in the bucket for OSHA, but they did inspect clinics. Not, I mean, inspect, they did desk audits, basically. So what I'm gonna talk to you is not about how to make money, but how to avoid losing money. 
You know, most of dentistry, nobody gets up in the morning to go and do something to have an in, uh, inspection or an investigation. We all go out in good faith to do dentistry, treat patients, earn our money. Yeah. So, uh, so infection control is different from OSHA. It's, and of course, different from HIPAA. These are the three areas. But I'm only going to talk about infection control and OSHA, what you need to do. Okay. Infection control, most states require a minimum of two hours of training in infection control annually. And some states where they renew the license once in two years, they require four hours. Okay, state boards of examiners. So when you click on the box, have you taken all your uh, training? When you click on the box, make sure you've done your hours of infection control because if they audit you for something, about 5% of the dentists are audited on a regular basis. The first thing they look at is, is your infection control logs, training logs. If you don't have it, they're $1,800 to $2,000. You'll have to hire a lawyer or go naked and say no lo contendere. Yeah. You need to implement CDC's guidelines. It's required for license renewal. You have to get it from an ADA, CERP, or an AGD provider. Choice of your provider is get a good person who knows the subject, who's at least a dentist, you know, and provides the training, okay? Then OSHA. OSHA is, the scope is for employees safety, okay? It's federally mandated. You have to have the initial basic training, which takes about two to four hours, depending on how much you want to go into it. And then annual updates. Every year you must have a training log. Okay, all states. No CD is given for OSHA because it's like CPR. Every two years you've got to take your CPR. You don't get CE for that. Same thing, OSHA, no CE. HIPAA, you have to have the initial training, you know, in the history, the scope of HIPAA, what is HIPAA meant for? Uh, the privacy rule, the security rule, the breach notification rule, the High Tech Act, and so on. All those areas, and you also have to differentiate between who is your covered entity and non uh, and a business associate. In Texas, it's different. You know, a business associate in other states is considered a covered entity to an extent in Texas, to make it easy for you guys. So when I bring this up on social media, ooh, he doesn't know the difference between, you know business associate and covered entity. No, in Texas, the rules are different. You know, there's called something called the House, Texas House Bill 300, which spells out, okay? So, no CE for that either, for HIPAA. It's federally mandated. You must get trained once every two years, updates. At least, they say at the minimum once every two years, okay? Infection control, you have to think about the history, okay? I gave you a part of the history, you should, you should know that. This is what is required by the state's boards. They spell out what all you should know. Impact of infectious diseases, selection, use, and misuse of germicides in dentistry, environmental surface barriers, uh, personal protective equipment. You know, last year we learned a lot about it, and we still don't, most of us still haven't had a face fit. Okay, hand hygiene. Instrument reprocessing, sterilization monitoring, maintenance of logs, for how long? Then chemical and biologic indicators. Then preservation of your sterility of your instruments and sterile release of your instruments. Those you need to know. Dental unit water systems. How many of you have actually uh, done testing of your water lines every, four, uh, every three months? Please lift your hands. One. Dr. Sparrow, two. Oh my God. You, you're something. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> treatment, uh, so what is the, does anybody know uh, the upper limit of your contamination levels of dental unit water, treatment water, microbiologically? How many colony farming units? 500? How many? Five? Five hundred CFU. Yeah, you're good. It used to be two hundred CFU. Okay. So those things and 
how do you clean it? What do you use? Dental safety and radiology. So those are some of the basic things you need to know. And you should know it well. Okay? Don't let conjecture lead you into compliance. Okay? And by the way, the word compliance. Oh, Dr. P, can you make our clinic compliant? <laughs> I live in... You know, there was an old movie where it talked about utopia. Shangri-La. Compliance is an absolute term. Nobody can ever be totally compliant in anything. You can put in good faith efforts to, uh, to reach out and try and touch compliance as an absolute term. So, um, <clears throat> OSHA, do you have a manual? Do you use your manual or does it have dust on it? Okay. In that, you know, fire, equipment safety, building safety, radiation safety, bloodborne pathogens and airborne pathogens control measures. It used to be bloodborne pathogens standards last uh, year before last, but last year with COVID, they have uh, OSHA for small business with respect to, um, you know, <coughs> airborne pathogens, okay? Chemicals in the workplace, hazard communications, globally harmonized systems. How many of you have heard of globally harmonized systems? Uh, you should have heard of it by in 2012 because it was mandated in 2012. Uh, then labeling from NFPA labels to GHS labels. Then there's, there has to be a checklist for your managers, you know? Contact information of staff, emergency telephone numbers, uh, numbers of the doctors, the fire department, uh, you know, all these things, the plumber, the attorney, all the numbers should be there at, you know, at your fingertips. Weekly logs of equipment, equipment safety checks, training logs and mandatory on, uh, training logs, you know, on all the items which is needed, uh, mandatory safety issues and updates, safety meetings. Do you have a safety meeting on any of the OSHA or the compliance issues at least once a year? Do you update the manual once a year? So those are some of the things on, comp uh, on the manual and the checklists. Now, the scope of OSHA, okay? Common citations, why do they happen? Why do inspections occur? What is an inspection? Is it a physical or a desk audit? You have to know the difference. What do you do in the event of an inspection? Can you refuse it? Or do you have to comply? There are options for that. Documents and posters that have to be used and updated. What do you do with the citations? Okay. Then in the building equipment and fire safety, you know, how many of you use, you use an inspection record, you know, for your equipment? This, there are safety measures, you know. You got to use it for, you know, your fire extinguishers, compressed gases, I wash stations, you know, and waste handling. What do you do for waste handling? Do you have a physician certified first aid kit which is in order? Change it every two years because all this uh, silicon and the rubber things degrade. Electrical safety. What is the other real name for an extension cord? Anybody? It's called temporary extension cord. That means not, they should not be permanently attached to any heavy utility devices, okay? Simple things. Uh, what is GFCI? Ground fault circuit interrupters, you know, the switch, the socket which goes off all of a sudden by itself and there's a red button and a white button. Where do you use that, you know? Then <coughs> I actually in, uh, inspected a clinic. They used a paper, like you have that exit sign, self-lit exit sign. They had a paper thing cut out. <laughs> pasted in. And the fire department had cleared it. So then CPR devices, you know, ANSI certified step ladders, uh, CPR devices, one way uh, CPR masks. Do you want to have the large one for the adults and the small one for the adolescents? Do you have those oxygen tanks? Do you do a weekly check on them? You know, suction devices, amalgam separators and ch checks and tags. You have to do that because that's what they will look at. These can actually expose microbes to your workers. That's what OSHA looks for. Uh, then bloodborne pathogens, scope. 
written exposure control plan, exposure determination, engineering and work practice controls, uh, control of bioaerosols, appropriate PPE, including respirators, okay? Housekeeping issues during normal and pandemic times. What's the difference? Shops, containers, and regulated waste. Laundry of PPE and other items like towels, blankies, and stuff. Not your scrubs within the clinic, but PPE, okay? Employee health records. How many of you have employee health records, which has the occupational history, immunization history, what they can take? All those things have to be there. Do you have a contact or a, not a, an informal agreement with a clinic close by, not a, a Baylor Medical Center, where a person has to go and wait for six hours to get a post-exposure protocol done? It has to happen right after. Within two hours you got of exposure, you have to get out the medication. So, uh, <coughs> TB testing, COVID testing, all those records have to go into that record. Exposure to blood-borne pathogen and post-exposure protocols, do you follow them? So these, not knowing the names, you should know how to do it and do it efficiently. You know, once you have this, this culture of safety, a system in place, and you understand it, it becomes easy, you know? Now, now chemical hazards in the workplace or hazard communications and the globally harmonized systems. Knowledge, risk, and safe handling of chemicals in the workplace. Why use GHS, employee right to know law and right to understand, okay? Uh, steps in implementation of the hazard communications uh, program and uh, the GHS, globally harmonized systems, collecting, cataloging, reading, understanding, and access for the safety data sheets, okay? Evidence-based risk to chemicals in the workplace. Understanding the NFPA versus the GHS labels. How do you generate those labels for your secondary containers? Everybody in every clinic has a secondary container. It is called the ultrasonic machine. It's called the instrument washer. Do you have the GHS labels on that? Then understanding and using pictograms and developing GHS labels. Not all manufacturers are providing GHS labels for their chemicals, okay? You have to get generic ones and then you have to label it and tag it. So these are some of the basics you need to understand. By the way, this is my beautiful website. Uh, we don't, we are not sponsored by any company, no product placement. We poo poo or we say this product is good. That's based on my knowledge and testing. Okay? We provide infection control, OSHA, HIPAA, training online, and we encourage clinics to take it, not just one person in a clinic or an individual. Take it as a team, you know, that might be something you may want to do. And we provide CE, uh, infection control, it's a four-hour program, OSHA two hours, HIPAA two hours. It's an overview, basically. Okay, and this is my contact information. And by the way, you'll all be getting by email, I'm sure. Uh, Nathan, you're gonna send by email the handouts, right? I've downloaded the handouts as well. Okay, you can email it to them. Adios, thank you. Thank you so much for coming to Dallas and to WinWin. -win.